Guten Morgen und herzlich willkommen, Herr Botschafter Emerson, lieber John Herbst, liebe Gäste von fern und nah, meine Damen und Herren, liebe Freundinnen und Freunde. Diese Konferenz ist ein Kooperationsprojekt der Böll Stiftung mit dem Atlantic Council und dem European Council on Foreign Relations. Und ich möchte mich gleich zu Beginn ganz herzlich für die gute Zusammenarbeit bedanken, insbesondere bei John und bei Alina Polikova vom American Council und Gustav Kassel vom European Council on Foreign Relations. Das gilt natürlich auch für meine Kolleginnen und Kollegen von der Böll Stiftung, die dieses Projekt ermöglicht haben, insbesondere Walter Kaufmann und Nina Happe. Ganz herzlichen Dank. Ich freue mich sehr über die beeindruckende internationale Besetzung dieser Tagung mit zahlreichen hochkarätigen Fachleuten aus Medien, aus Politik, Zivilgesellschaft, Wissenschaft. Insbesondere, erlauben Sie mir das, möchte ich unsere Gäste aus Russland hier begrüßen. Der Austausch mit kritischen Journalistinnen, Journalisten und NGOs in Russland ist in diesen Tagen wichtiger denn je. Und das Thema unserer Tagung, russische Desinformation im 21. Jahrhundert, betrifft ja nicht nur die systematische Kampagne russischer Staatsmedien im Ausland, insbesondere in Europa, sondern zuallererst Russland selbst. Also die groß angelegte Gleichschaltung, zumindest der Versuch der Gleichschaltung der Medien und der Öffentlichkeit, die systematische nationalistische Propaganda, die Produktion von Feindbildern, die geradezu orwellhafte Verwischung von Lüge und Wahrheit, alles das betrifft zunächst Russland selbst und ist eine systematische Vergiftung des politischen Diskurses und dessen, was man vielleicht noch als Rest politischer Öffentlichkeit in Russland sagen, bezeichnen kann. Ähm, es gibt ja viele Stimmen bei uns, würde ich sagen, wo der Wunsch Vater des Gedankens ist, dass dieser Konflikt mit Russland, der sich aktuell an der Ukraine entzündet hat, sagen, nur ein vorübergehender, ein kurzfristiger Konflikt sein möge, eine kurzfristige Störung in der Normalität der Zusammenarbeit und der Beziehungen zwischen Russland und dem, dem Westen. Ich verstehe diesen Wunsch sehr gut, weil die Frage des Verhältnisses zu Russland natürlich für die ganze europäische Friedensordnung und die Frage von Sicherheit und Zusammenarbeit in Europa von zentraler Bedeutung ist. Und weil uns allen sehr unwohl ist bei dem Gedanken, wir würden in eine neue, langanhaltende Konfrontation mit Russland rutschen. Trotzdem bin ich überzeugt, dass wir uns auf eine längerfristige Auseinandersetzung einstellen müssen. Dass das nicht sozusagen nur ein Betriebsunfall ist in den Beziehungen zwischen Russland und Russland der Europäischen Union und den USA, sondern dass es in den letzten Jahren in Russland doch sehr tiefgreifende Verschiebungen im Machtgefüge, in der Staatsideologie und in der Politik sagen, gegeben hat, die nicht nur außenpolitischer Natur sind. Die russische Führungselite versteht sich inzwischen als Gegenprojekt zur liberalen Demokratie. Und die Frage der Propaganda, der Desinformation, bezieht sich eben nicht nur auf diesen 
außenpolitischen Konflikt um die Ukraine, die Frage, wer ist dafür verantwortlich, wer sind die Akteure, welche Rolle spielt Russland in diesem Konflikt, sondern das ist auch eine gesellschaftspolitische Auseinandersetzung. Und vor dieser gesellschaftspolitischen Auseinandersetzung können wir nicht wegducken, der können wir nicht ausweichen, sondern wir müssen sie annehmen. Und das bedeutet aber auch, dass wir dafür sorgen müssen, dass die Ausstrahlungskraft liberaler Demokratien wieder zunimmt, indem wir auch sagen, die Demokratie in unserem eigenen Haus wieder in Ordnung bringen und zum Strahlen bringen und auch indem wir ähm, im Hinblick auf ökonomische Dynamik die Anziehungskraft der westlichen Gesellschaften weltweit wieder stärken. Also es ist nicht nur eine Frage von Medienpolitik und von Informationspolitik, das geht sehr viel tiefer, diese Auseinandersetzung zwischen Autoritarismus und liberaler Demokratie, in der wir uns gegenwärtig befinden und nicht nur mit Russland befinden. Aber es hat natürlich auch eine spezifische Medien politische Seite. Sagen ein wichtiger Gesichtspunkt, über den heute sicher äh, geredet werden wird, ist die Frage, wie wir auch alternative russischsprachige Medien entweder stärken oder neu aufbauen können, um das weitgehende Informationsmonopol vor allem äh, im Fernsehen und äh, in den sozialen Medien des Kremls aufzubrechen. Das ist nicht nur eine Frage der politischen Meinungsbildung in Russland selbst, das betrifft sagen, die ganze russischsprachige Welt in Mittelosteuropa und ist sogar auch eine Frage für die Bundesrepublik, wo ein guter Teil der Einwanderer aus der ehemaligen Sowjetunion äh, sich aus russischsprachigen Medien, und zwar aus den Staatsmedien, informiert und aus denen ihr politisches Weltbild bezieht, weshalb es ähm, eben auch durchaus politische Sympathien für das Vorgehen Russlands auch in dieser Community in der Bundesrepublik gibt. Vor allem aber denke ich, ist das eine Frage, wie wir die noch verbliebenen unabhängigen kritischen freien Medien in Russland selbst unterstützen können und die Kerne einer demokratischen Zivilgesellschaft in Russland. Das ist nicht nur eine Frage von Medien im engeren Sinn. Das ist jedenfalls ein Grundanliegen für uns als Stiftung. Das ist die Leitlinie schon seit langem unserer Arbeit in Russland selbst. Und deshalb würden wir den Begriff Russland verstehen auch nicht gerne denen überlassen, die jetzt Partei für Putin ergreifen, sondern wir beanspruchen, und das gilt, glaube ich, auch für die anderen äh, Partner dieses Unternehmens, dass wir ähm, nicht nur sehr viel Sympathie haben für Russland und für die, die russische Gesellschaft, sondern dass wir vielleicht auch besser verstehen, was da gegenwärtig stattfindet. Also ich hoffe auf eine sehr interessante und ähm, produktive Tagung mit einigen auch handlungsorientierten Schlussfolgerungen. Die berühmte Frage Lenins, was tun, stellt sich auch uns und übergebe damit an John Herbst für sein Grußwort und füge noch bedauernd dazu ist, ist mir ein bisschen peinlich, dass ich äh, im Laufe des Vormittags hier gehen muss, weil wir schon seit langem eine Leitungsklausur der Stiftung für diesen Tag festgelegt haben, die sich nicht mehr verschieben ließ. Ich werde mich aber ähm, informieren darüber, äh, was hier heute stattgefunden hat. Und Sie können sicher sein, dass das keine Eintagsfliege bleibt, sondern dass das zu einem Follow-up führen wird. Vielen Dank. John, the floor is yours.
Ralph, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the Heinrich Wolf Stiftung and the European Council on Foreign Relations for working with us to make this event possible in this absolutely stunning room. Uh, I'd like to thank Ambassador Emerson from the Embassy, the American Embassy here in Berlin, for joining us for this event. Uh, and I think actually Ralph said some of the things I intended to say, so I'll have to change my words a little bit to speak to you for the next seven or eight minutes. Uh, you know, I remember being a student of the Soviet Union 40 years ago, and uh, there were many amazing and um, truly awful things about the Soviet regime. But the thing that struck me most, perhaps because I always had a love for history, uh, and in fact, for those of you non-native English speakers, let me use a word you may not have heard, I was flabbergasted uh, by the abuse of history in the Soviet regime by the phenomenon that now you'd see Trotsky in a picture with, with Lenin doing something critical during the October Revolution, and now you don't, because it became politically inconvenient for Stalin to recognize that Trotsky was the second most important figure in uh, Bolshevik history. And of course, that pattern, which um, Stalin established early, became the pattern of Soviet disinformation. Um, I'm older now, and it's harder for me to get flabbergasted. But I'd have to say that this is absolutely extraordinary and technically sophisticated uh, Kremlin disinformation campaign that we have seen over the past several years is truly an astonishing phenomenon. Astonishing for its technical competence, astonishing for its clear understanding of its target audience, whether that target audience is in Russia or abroad, um, so targeted that like a, uh, a political campaign in the United States, um, it is able to identify microgroups and address specific messages to those microgroups. For example, the Polish minority in some of the Baltic states gets its own message which harp on traditionally not always easy relations between the, that Polish minority and the majorities, whether it's in Lithuania, especially Lithuania. So very sophisticated in that way, but astonishing too for the ultimate crudity of its message. A crudity that was analyzed by um, Peter Pomerantsev as playing to the postmodernist ethic that there are multiple narratives for any circumstance. Uh, the brazenness of this disinformation campaign is such that Mr. Putin can say hundreds if not thousands of times, repeated by other senior Russian officials, that, oh no, there were no Russian troops in Crimea. And then a few months after the annex annexation, quotation marks, Acknowledge, in fact, this was a Russian military operation from the get-go. And yet, and yet, Western media repeat his lies today about there being no Russian troops in the Donbass without any reference to this brazen piece of, um, let's say, something less than honesty. Uh, and Mr. Putin's brazenness is such that he felt no political problems in acknowledging his admiration very publicly for Joseph Goebbels. And again, no, there seems to be no memory of this in senior Western circles, senior Western media circles. The Russian disinformation campaign is a very important tool in broader Kremlin objectives. And those objectives are not very pretty. It starts with the most obvious and most important, something which is not well understood in many Western capitals. Um, it is very well understood in Eastern parts of the West, like in the Baltic states and in Poland and in Romania, 
but not so much the farther west you move, including to Washington, uh, that Mr. Putin wants to change the rules of the post-Cold War order. And again, his brazenness is such that if any of you are watching the um, television broadcast from the Valdai Forum, the famous Valdai Forum, which was just held over the last few days, there was a board behind Mr. Putin as he spoke, sort of like the board behind here advertising the Heinrich Bolsch diphthong, and that board said, Valdai Forum. And then underneath it said, Global Order, New Rules or No Rules. So he's right there. He's not hiding this, folks. Uh, so that's, that's goal one. But goal two, as part, and excuse me, as part of goal one, that means he wants his sphere of influence at an absolute minimum in the, within the borders of the former Soviet Union, which, by the way, we all know, as he understands, it includes three NATO members, but also more broadly in the Warsaw Pact area, which includes even more NATO members and neighboring countries to Germany, among other older members of NATO. Now, his second objective in this general category is he has a very clear goal of enhancing the Russian international position by weakening NATO and weakening the EU. You weaken NATO by causing doubt, to sowing doubt among its members about Article 5 commitments. And he's done a pretty good job of that. Um, he, did a, he, he demonstrated his skill two days after Mr. Obama visited Tallinn last September to reassure the Balts that, in fact, now no, don't worry about those pesky fellows to the east. The very same day that the NATO summit ended, when he engineered the kidnapping of an Estonian counterintelligence official from Estonia. And this gentleman is now in jail in Russia. He was telling the Baltics, people of the Baltic states, you think NATO has your back? And of course, on the EU side, uh, he does not want there to be a single EU policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia, especially most famously in the energy area. He wants to cut his individual deals with Bulgaria, with Germany, with Hungary, with Italy, and so on. And so what does he do? What does he do in this area? Well, uh, he, f he funds fringe parties of the left and the right in Hungary and France and elsewhere. Parties designed that want to pull down the EU and for that matter, want to weaken liberal values at, in their respective homelands. The message is clear for anyone who's able to receive it. Mr. Putin's objectives are not benign. And so how does disinformation fit into this? It's pretty simple. On the one hand, he does not want there to be a conscious recognition of his broader objectives. He wants each crisis in which Moscow somehow has a role, be that in southern Ossetia and Abkhazia, be that in Crimea, be that in the Donbass, to be understood strictly as a local crisis, not part of a broader pattern. That's the strategic objective of his disinformation campaign. The tactical objective is to divert attention from any specific incidents which is embarrassing to Moscow or its allies. And of course, the premier example of that is MH17 when for anyone who watched carefully, you had a crash course in the use of postmodernist techniques to confuse. So what happened with the shoot down of that airline? Oh, it was a Ukrainian fighter plane. Oh, it was the Pentagon. Oh, it was whatever. It was to distract attention from what, re to what, from what really happened. Uh, last point which I like to make almost any time I speak about these sorts of questions. Nothing here, as we, as we dissect this phenomenon, is anti-Russian. Nothing here is directed at the Russian people. What we are looking at is the last vestige of KGB power, of unreconstructed power of those who ran the Soviet Union, 
Not that Russia today under Putin is the Soviet Union. It's not. It's not nearly as dangerous. But the early years of this millennium, 2000, 2006, 2007, was the Indian summer of the Soviet Empire. And for those of you who don't know American English, Indian summer refers to that time in the fall when it's very nice and warm. And you think you have a summer-like condition, you don't know it's going to turn cold the next day. Even before, uh, well, maybe not before the Georgian War, but certainly years before the crisis in Ukraine that Moscow precipitated, serious scholars of Russia understood that the Putin economic model, which you could describe as a certain amount of macroeconomic um, stability, should be, uh, responsibility, uh, vast hydrocarbon wealth, and corruption, three constituent elements, was not going to guarantee Russia further economic development, was not going to lead to the improved lives of the Russian people. And therefore, Putin would need some other gimmick to maintain his power. What this means now, especially with oil prices and gas prices so low, we are seeing the last gasps of a stable Putinesque regime. And by the way, I'm not here advocating overthrowing his regime. No, 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 no. I'm just giving you analysis here. And his efforts now internationally are designed to bolster his position domestically. And he's having some success with this. But this is a game that will not last long because the Russian people are not that blind. And I, I leave you with a quote from Kluchevsky, which those of people who know me have heard me say far too many times, that when Moscow expands, the Russian people suffer. And that's precisely the two pillars of the current Putin regime. Thank you. Thank you, John. And now I would like to invite Ambassador John Emerson, please. Uh, thank you very much, Ralph, and um, let me make sure I get this on. Guten Morgen. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and see so many uh, familiar faces in the room. And today's conference is, in many respects, um, an example of the essence of democracy. And I can tell from the two extraordinary, compelling opening statements that we just heard uh, that unlike many conferences, this is one where you will be cutting to the chase <laughs> and um, uh, directly dealing with the issues involved. So uh, I congratulate you and, uh, and thank you for that. Today we're obviously discussing a problem that's been with us ever since the little green men um, showed up in February of 2014 to invade Crimea which is countering the Kremlin disinformation campaign. I'll offer a few thoughts uh, that I hope will stimulate discussion and, and actually lead to some specific ideas about how we can expand our network and continue to work together to keep the information space free and to ensure that our publics have facts and not propaganda. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to uh, reiterate what uh, Ambassador Herbst said and thanking the Atlantic Council, the European Council on Foreign Relations, uh, and of course our host, the Heinrich Boll Foundation, for gathering such remarkable participants from a cross-section of government, human rights organizations, uh, and uh, uh, Russian media and political opposition here today. Uh, in particular, I welcome the distinguished representatives of three organizations that are hosting today's conference. Um, Ralph Fuchs, of course, the president of the Heinrich Boll Foundation, our moderators, uh, Gustav Gressel of the European Council, and of course, Ambassador John Herbst, uh, who uh, not only is the director of the Atlantic Council's uh, Eurasian Center, but is the former United States ambassador to Ukraine, among other places. Um, one of the stars of our foreign service. And of course, uh, I don't know if Carl Bildt is here yet, but uh, um, I would want to certainly acknowledge him. Uh, it's great to have him participating in this conference as well. Um, all of us are here today because we're champions of free speech. 
which is one of the core values of the transatlantic relationship. And we're here because the Russian government and the media that it controls are trying to prevent the publication of information that doesn't conform to Russia's aims and are trying to, in fact, are in fact manipulating the presentation of information to cloak Russia's actions. The Kremlin's disinformation campaign goes far beyond controlling its own media, as we have just heard. It is aimed at nothing less than presenting a parallel version of the universe and disseminating it as if it were news. The Kremlin's goal is to make people question the value of media at all and to reject the idea of an absolute truth and to persuade the public that reality is simply relative. The two reports that you're going to discuss today reflect that approach, or firmly reject that approach. Atlantic Council's report, Hiding in Plain Sight, presents a clear picture of the extent of Russian military involvement in the conflict in Ukraine. And this report lays out how Russian soldiers occupied Crimea, something that, uh, as we just heard, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, continually uh, rejected and denied until uh, several months after the actual events. Uh, this report shows how Russian troops are currently fighting in Ukraine and why these events need to be brought into the cold light of day. The second report is Putin War, which the Russian opposition leader, of course, Boris, uh, uh, Boris Nepsov, was working on when he was gunned down near the Kremlin in February. And before he was killed, he had been meeting with families of Russian soldiers who died in the war in Ukraine, and he was demanding answers from his government. But his death did not stop the inquiry, and his supporters completed the mission. The swift condemnation of his assassination by the international community and the publication of his work are testament to the indomitable human striving to set the truth free and Berlin is just one stop on the Atlantic Council's tour of European capitals to organize discussion around these reports, ensuring the widest possible audience. The extent of the Kremlin's goal, uh, a global disinformation ambition, is evident in the media enterprises that it finances. A $400 million median operation that extends to over 100 countries this operation includes the Russian Today Network that offers slick entertainment programs interspersed with manipulated Russian news content. The Russian Today News Agency offers video content provided via, via its Ruptly website for a modest subscription fee. One of RT's ploys is to download content from social media sites and then package it as news. Kremlin trolls are using social media to lead carefully organized attacks against the Internet, the ultimate democratic communications medium. They flood the comments sections of online news sites in the U.S. and Europe, particularly articles that are critical of Russia, and they flood it with hate speech, vulgar language, and outright lies. The goal is to make the public think that the Internet is an ungoverned zone of unreliable information. And whenever I meet with editorial boards throughout Germany, which is something I do on virtually a weekly basis, my observation that any article that is mildly critical of Russia will be met by a torrent of criticism in social media is always greeted with a series of nods and sardonic smiles around the table. This campaign of obfuscation has become all too familiar since the occupation of Crimea. Some have called it the 4D approach. Dismiss, as Putin did for over a month, well, over several months, uh, when he dismissed the obvious fact that Russian soldiers had occupied Crimea. Distort, as an actress did in playing the role of a pro-Russian uh, Ukrainian in, a suppo in supposed news accounts, distract, as Russian media did with the ludicrous theories about what happened to uh, uh, MA flight, or MH Flight 17, and dismay, 
as Russia's ambassador to Denmark did in March when he threatened to aim nuclear weapons at Danish warships if Denmark joined NATO's missile defense system. This campaign strives to obscure that Putin intends to create dissension among allies and undermine the global rules-based system. And I find that sign that Ambassador Herbst spoke about behind Putin uh, ironic, to say the least. So far, he has failed. In El Mau earlier this month, the G7 leaders declared their respect for international law and for human rights and they declared their support for the sovereign equality of all states, specifically including the Ukraine. In the face of Putin's overt, calculated, and strategic effort to define reality, we have to be as strategic in forging bonds of solidarity with everyone who shares our ideals and our commitment to defending the free information space. My presence here is somewhat paradoxical government support for media independence carries inherent contradictions. But in the interest of this discussion, I will outline a couple of the ways in which the U.S. government is trying to uphold the institution of the fourth estate. Freedom of speech is a fundamental human right, and defending that right is a key objective of our diplomatic engagement throughout all of our embassies. The only answer to disinformation, of course, is more information, accurate information, obtained through unfettered investigative reporting. And in this regard, I, I want to uh, commend the German media for their coverage of the crisis in Ukraine and for, in fact, exposing and addressing the Russian government's crude efforts to deceive the public, as well as for keeping U.S. officials, such as myself, on our toes to make sure that we're delivering the accurate information. We understand that you're going to ask tough questions and you deserve honest answers from all of us. For our part, the Department of State has increased funding to train journalists to uphold the ethics of journalism in pursuit of the truth. We're not telling people what to write or what to publish or what to talk about, but we are helping them to learn the skills and the tradecraft of professional journalism. In Latvia last month, for instance, we contributed funding for a tech camp for 60 reporters from Eastern Europe who worked with independent veteran journalists on how to use modern technology to be better reporters. And in our embassies worldwide, we're working to change cultures of impunity in societies where crimes committed against journalists are ignored. We raise those cases in our meetings with the host governments, and we pressure them and advocate for prosecutions against those who attack members of the media. The Kremlin's iron grip over Russia's media is driving some who believe in press freedom to speak out, which sadly sometimes costs them their jobs. Recently, a reporter for Russia's NTV was fired for providing candid comments to a German television station. Some of us remember NTV as the channel that first gained a national audience in Russia for investigative reporting about Chechnya in the late 1990s. Correspondent Konstantin Goldenzweig manifested some of NTV's former independent spirit when he told his German interviewer that Putin felt insulted by being excluded from the G7 summit in Almau, and then compared Putin's authoritarian regime with the Soviet Union in the late 1980s. After being dismissed, Goldenzweig apologized for participating in the, quote, propaganda madness, end quote, of the Kremlin media machine in his posting on Facebook. Others are fighting the propaganda madness by speaking on the record to international reporters and conducting investigative reports, such as the June 2nd report in the New York Times Magazine about the troll operation in St. Petersburg. In March of 2014, Liz Fall, an anchor woman for Russia Today in Washington, D.C., famously quit because she no longer wanted to work for a network that whitewashed Putin's actions. Beyond losing your job, some Russian journalists have been victims of physical abuse and terror. Just last week, Pavel Kanyagin, a reporter for, for Novata Gazeta, was detained, beaten up, and then accused of drug offenses in Donetsk while he covering anti-war demonstrations. 
And the stakes, of course, are even higher for champions of the free press and free speech in Russia. In commenting upon her father's death, Boris Nepsov's daughter, Siana, said, Russia propaganda kills. She drew the line of culpability directly to the Russian media that incited hatred toward the political opposition and branded them traitors simply for holding a different political point of view. Journalist, author, and human rights activist Anna Politskova, oh boy, I blew that one, uh, Politskovaya, an outspoken critic of Russian's conduct of the war in Chechnya and of President Putin's policies, was killed in 2006. All of us know it is not enough to realize reports and then sit back and wait for someone else to take action. Democracy requires action, and that's what this conference is all about. Kremlin disinformation cannot spread if human rights advocates like Ambassador Herbst and Carl Bildt and organizations like the Atlantic Council, the European Council on Foreign Relations, and the Heinrich Boll Stiftung continue to publish the objective truth. This conference is an important and a responsible action in response to the challenge that we face, this challenge to the democratic community of nations. So I thank you for your participation today, and I hope that during this conference you'll come up with specific actionable ideas for us to implement together to create a space where the truth can see the light of day. Herzlich and Dank. Vielen Dank, Herr Botschafter. Und damit übergebe ich an Gustav Gressel für die Moderation des ersten Podiums.